you have 50 years of history. I mean, that in and of itself is quite an accomplishment. In the early years, the Institute actually made its mark more in the academic community, where it did help pioneer, I think, a more interesting and fruitful approach to the study of international relations. It's more uh, looking at things that aren't being well covered in part because they don't lend themselves to uh, national solutions or the sum of, of the leading countries uh, approach, but rather need to be looked at uh, by all countries from a global perspective. How you couldn't really draw a line at the border and say, well, you know, economics is a domestic issue or immigration is a domestic issue, but, uh, you know, how our economic policies, economic strength, affected our ability to act in the world. Where the Institute and the Journal have made their mark the most is in incubating a whole series of remarkable writers uh, and opinion leaders in international affairs. To start with Eric Alterman, who was probably one of the first to come out and has written a whole slew of books uh, up to and including Kabuki Democracy. I remember uh, the, you know, that the kind of heady days when on, in one corner of the floor Tina Rosenberg of the New York Times was working on her book that won the Pulitzer Prize, The Haunted Land. Ian Bremmer, who went on to found Eurasia Group, was working on his Eurasia project, you know, and a lot of people were in their 20s and it was all very exciting. Um, uh, Ahmed Rashid, who published his article on Jihad and World Policy Journal that became his very big book. Um, the book on the end of alliances, Raja Menon, also began as an article in World Policy Journal. Silvana Paternostro's work on Colombia and Mexico, her, her article, Narco Democracy. In order to be able to bring that breath of fresh air into policy making, you need to bring in younger thinkers, people who don't necessarily look or sound like the usual suspects, but you need to bring all of them together. It's not just uh, for one group or one clique. It's about bringing together different perspectives across issue areas, across political boundaries, and across national boundaries. We did a conference on security and migration in Berlin where we had people from four different countries and more importantly from the security side and the immigration side, two sides of a, one issue that never talk. There is nothing in this world like World Policy Journal. And let me explain why. There is no other magazine published in the United States or anywhere else in the world that succeeds in getting voices from all over the world speaking in English to a global audience. By chance, I knew someone who had been in Darfur. He was a former Marine. And he came around to us and he said, Carl, there's a terrible thing going on in Darfur, and I'd like to write about it. World Policy Institute had an entire journal actually looking at the sustainability of cities. Speaking from many different angles, developed world, developing world, women's point of view, security point of view. And that's really what I think it takes to delve down into how are we going to create new policies and new institutions to really address some of these more complex issues that we're seeing in the world today. The Institute, the Journal, the panel discussions we held, the conferences we supported were all attempts to reorient thinking in this country towards embracing the notion, the great internationalist notion. It's very non-partisan. It's not about the right or the left or, or one side being against another side. It's really about bringing sides together. The future should be, I think, very much involved with international, not only political, but economic and financial affairs. We just emerged, I hope have emerged, from a major, major financial crisis. And I think the WPI and the talents at command is tailor-made for trying to lead the way out of this.